Amen and amen. Amen, and amen again. Amen. Happy Father's Day. I know Tim already told you Happy Father's Day, but gentlemen, uh, I'm pr proud of you and praise the Lord for you. Most important things would be godly fathers. Amen. Uh, you will be receiving a gift at the end of the service. Brother Tim will remind you on the way out. Uh, you've heard of the iPad? Well, we don't have that for you today. <laughs> but we do have the T-pad. The T-pad is quite similar to the iPad. Uh, we named this the T-pad because we have a staff member whose name begins with T, whose last name begins with Strickland, <laughs> who's quite technologically challenged. ATD or something, I forgot what the, the, the actual proper letters are for that. But this is a Believer's Fellowship T-pad, not just any T-pad. So he didn't pick this out, but we know it's going to be helpful for him especially. He carries a T-pad, but it's an old, old, old version. Still got the ring binders, you know, up here. That's the antenna, I think, or something on it. It's got that metal ring on it. But the T-pad's pretty neat. It powers up much faster than the iPad. All you have to do is just turn it up like this. Bam, it's on. You can't beat that. It comes with a, a, a nice stylus, also known as an ink pen. All right, so it's, it's pretty simple. If you want to uh, start a file, you just take it. If you want to start a new file, you just take it again. <laughs> you can write whatever you like on that, that particular file, all right, and you, you can do whatever you want. If you want to save that file, you simply fold it over. <laughs> and immediately, without asking for another file, you get another file. Again, no waiting whatsoever. It's amazing. You take the stylus, you do whatever they're saying, but say, well, you don't want to keep that file, then this is for deleting the file. So it's, it's pretty handy, pretty nifty, and when you, when you, you know, it goes into hibernation as soon as you shut it. So it's, it's quite a deal. You'll want to receive that on your way out. Also has a, a calendar program and a calendar app right in the very front. That's free. There's no extra charge for the calendar app. There are some other apps that you can get with that, but Tim Strickland's the only one that knows where to get them. I think they might do like with color stylus and stuff like that, all right? But be sure and pick this up. It's a handy little device to have around. Amen? Especially for a bunch of you guys who are also technically challenged. Happy Father's Day, amen? You can't beat a deal like that. Where else can you go this morning and get a tea pad? Only at Believer's Fellowship. There it is. They're hiding my, hiding my, my technology from me here. Today we want to talk about the call of, of a father and the ministry of a father and what God expects of a father. And uh, I really want to get down to business, men, because I think it's so important that men understand these principles because I believe if you follow a biblical process of, of homes, nations, governments that have fallen, it usually gets back to leadership. And it's so important that we men should be leaders in our culture, on our jobs, in our communities and most specifically in our home. If you follow the biblical pattern, leadership has to be proven first in the home before it really is exercised without the home. You know, a faithful man is going to be a faithful man at home, and he, he, he learns leadership, he learns faithfulness there, and that's demonstrated throughout the rest of his life. I have seven quick points, and they are quick this morning. I'll try to, you know, on Mother's Day, I went a little short for you, so we'll try not to do too much today as well. Uh, but you remember also I was real sweet on Mother's Day. I cannot guarantee that today. Because if anybody needs a strong word today, it is men. If anybody needs a prophetic word today, it is men. So if you're a young man, unmarried, not a father yet, this message is for you if you're a man in this room. If you're of the male species and gender, this message is for you. There will be things in this sermon I share with you, ladies, that you will glean from, be a blessing in your life, and help you in your spiritual walk with God. But the primary target here is for men, and especially for fathers and husbands, that you get a grip on these simple principles today. It will transform your life as well as, I believe, your family's life. So let's just start very quickly. The first, the first call of a father is to be provider. 1 Timothy 5, 8, if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially those of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. Now, obviously, this pretty clear picture of what God's expectation is. And by the way, every one of these seven points that I'm going to make this morning 
or a picture of your heavenly Father, what God is like and how God provides for his family and for his people. And he is a provider. He is known as Jehovah Jireh, my God shall supply, my God will provide. And this is exactly what God has called men to be in the home and in their life, providers. Now, that's just first, obviously, I think there's that, 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 mode, that part about, you know, providing financially, fiscally for your family. You have that responsibility. You are and should be the number one chief provider in your home. You may both work, but obviously a man is supposed to be sure that security is given in this particular part. Now, I know that today we're living in a cultural and an economic environment that is not conducive. We lose jobs. We change jobs. And you may be in one of those transitions. But if you've been in that transition for more than 10 years, you're lazy. <laughs> All right? You got a problem. You need to straighten your act up. It's one thing to have be between a job and without a job for a time, but to be satisfied and to be settled in that is not correct and it's not right and it's not righteous and not what God expects for a man. You have this, this opportunity God's given you to provide. But it's also a responsibility. And since God does say this about men, then I think through prayer God will provide ultimately the job you need. And you should be praying and you should be first, you know, putting yourself before God in this, and then putting your resume out everywhere else. But that provision goes far beyond just a financial provision, sir. It goes into other areas. It, it deals with providing security, not just financially, but security on, on so many different levels in your life. It goes in the point of providing identity. Most young people today have no concept of identity. That's why they leave their homes, they head out to school, and they start finding a group in which they can feel comfortable with or identify. I'm going to be this kind of person, or I'll let these, these people accept me, so I'll be like them, or those druggies will accept me, so I'll be like them, you know, or the cowboys accept me, so I'll be a cowboy. You know, whatever it might be, whatever fad, whatever fashion goes on, people are always seem to be searching for their identity. And I talked about this at our senior honoring banquet. That God has put that in us to, to look for identity. But he wants us to find that identity in the family of God. But that's what our, our home starts. We are a family of God home. And if we're a family of God home, then we can teach our kids what it means to find a place of acceptance and what it means to find a place of identity, of recognition. And you, as a man, of first and foremost, you had that responsibility of instilling that understanding of who they are, that they are created in the image of God. They are created by God, and they are created for the glory of God. It's your responsibility to provide those things. Husband also, in this context of provision, provides security, identity, but unity as well. Uh, in fact, the, the word husband comes from an old terminology, English term, house ban. He's the one who bands everything together and keeps everything in accord and not discard, who brings peace to the environment, who brings an atmosphere of acceptance, but also with unity and identity and security. I believe it's the Father's primary role to provide a sense of destiny, that we are the people of God and that we are headed for an eternal home, that our children learn that this is not our home. We are just passing through. It's not about getting all I can, canning all I get, and setting on my can, all right? It's about purpose. It's about identity. It's about destiny. I belong to God, and one day I'm going to stand in the presence of God, and I'm going to live for the glory of God forever and ever. Somehow, by some means, and we'll talk about that in a moment, that sense of identity has to be provided by the one who is the provider in the home. That spiritual direction, along with that moral direction, has to be provided by a good father, a provider. The second point is this, but not only is he a provider, he's a protector. Now, I think that men today don't understand this concept. If your world, sir, is all about you, you're never going to understand this concept. If you think your wife is just there for you, you're not going to understand it. If you think your kids have just been given to you to provide someone to go get the remote so you don't have to get up, you know, you can train a dog to do that. Amen? It's not about you. In fact, when you stood and you said, yes, I do, to your wife, that meant that you died to your life. She died to her life. You came together in a new life. You're now one. The old identity is gone. And that identity is found in Jesus. But here's what happens in the physical realm. You have children. We'll start back, back up. You have a wife. That's the best way to start. Amen? You have a wife. 
She embraces you, but she also loses her identity, and she takes on your identity. That's why your identity has to be found in Christ. She takes your name, and she becomes Mrs., in my situation, Mrs. Arms. And those children that are born, that come into our home, they become little armses, all right? <laughs> they take my name. They didn't take her name. They took my name. And if you're going to have children... And if you're going to be a husband, you need to make sure that your name is not an embarrassment to the family. That your name is not a, a, a point of slander by the family and by those who are around. That your name means something. That your name, when your name is mentioned, means integrity, means character, means destiny. It means strength. It has something to do with what God has called you to do. So you ultimately, not only provider, you are protector. You've died to living just for you. Now you're living for others, and you're living for God. You provide protection physically. You stand between your family and harm, and physical harm. That's the obvious, at that point, on protection. I don't think there's a man in here who's a father or a husband who loves his wife in any fashion or form, even just a little bit, would not take a bullet for his wife or for his family. But I think that has to go beyond just the physical concept, uh, context of that. We provide protection socially. We're, we are there to help them absorb the pressures. Our lives, our wives, our children are under a constant attack. And husbands and fathers are there to provide a shelter. They're there to provide a place where somebody can find strength and find encouragement and find hope from the pressures that come into our, to our families. We're there to not only pro protect them in this regard, we have a responsibility to protect them spiritually. Satan is out to destroy you. Because if he knows he can get to you, he can get to everybody else in your family. You're the doorway which he has to come through. You're the avenue by which he wants to enter in. So you have to stand right with God as a protector of your family because if you don't, everything you do, I believe in Exodus where it says the sins of the father are passed down to the next generation. We don't want our children duplicating our failures. We want our children duplicating our successes. So we have this responsibility to be right with God. First of all, we protect physically. Second of all, we protect spiritually. Third of all, we protect socially. I mean, second, third is spiritually. We stand between the powers of darkness. We hold up the shield. We are praying for protection. We're praying for wisdom. We're praying for discernment for our children, for our wife, for our family. So we pray in that regard spiritually, but also mentally and emotionally. We are to provide protection. A man who is filled with the Spirit of God will, by his very presence, create a secure and a protected environment. Your wife, your children will feel safe around you, and safe from harm, safe from trauma, safe from the crisis that the world has. People need someone to turn to. You ought to be the person they can turn to. Your kids need somebody to turn to. You ought to be the one that they can turn to. So you stand first of all as provider and then as protector. But also you have a priestly role. A priest is someone who goes to God on behalf of someone else. It's not about you for you going to God to get something for you. It's about you in this context of being a priest about going to God to get something and to represent your children or your wife. You stand there as a priest before the Lord. The Bible tells us, obviously, that every Christian is a priest in the Lord. But a husband's role, a father's role, means that we stand before God on behalf of our children, on behalf of our wife. And how do we do that? We stand before God and we claim the promises of God. We claim the power of God. We claim the protection of God over our families and over our children. You can't back up at this point. You have to stand up. You cannot say this little line, which I've heard far too many times. Pastor, my wife's the spiritual one in the family. Well, shame on you. Shame on you. God didn't call her to lead the home. He called you to lead the home. He called you to wear the pants. He called you, and I'm talking about spiritually wear the pants. You may wear the pants in a physical way, but it goes beyond that because you are supposed to be the representative for your family before God and for you to be what God's called you to be. 
Far too many men in our culture, as they leave the room, I can clearly see this yellow bright line going down the backside. Because they won't stand for God. They think it's their wives' responsibility to teach the Bible to the children. They think it's their wives' responsibility to teach the promises of God to their children. And they won't stand up and be a man of God. And it's a sad sight, because that's not what God designed for you, sir. He wants you to be bold as a lion courageous in every situation and circumstances, even when you don't feel like it, even when though you may be intimidated by what's going on, you don't give up, you don't give ground, you stand, and you be before God what God wants you to be. I believe God wants to do miracles in our families. I believe God wants to do miracles in our children. I believe God wants to do something supernatural with our lives, but we cannot do that if we're content to sit back and say, well, honey, you're more spiritual than I am, then you should do that. Hey, if she is more spiritual than you, get after it. Get in the Word of God. Get submitted to Christ. Be filled with the Spirit. Be a man. Because if you're just a man without God, you're nothing. A man without God amounts to nothing. That is not God's design for man and humanity. It is for God to live in you, for make you, making you complete, so that you can be like Christ, and so that Christ can shine through your life, and you can be a man of God. It requires priesthood, but also, like the priest, the kind of, it's kind of a role of the prophet. Is this, the next one It's a little different from the priestly role. A prophet goes to someone on behalf of God. The priest goes to God on behalf of someone. What am, who am I going to? Well, if I'm a father and a husband, I'm going to my family on behalf of God. I'm letting them know what the Word of God says. That's what prophets would do. Prophets would get a word from God. They'd speak the word to the nation. They'd speak the word to the, to the leadership. They'd speak the word to the home. We are prophets of God if we're men, if we're husbands, if we are family men. God's called you to be a biblical prophet. What does that mean? I'm the one who intercedes for my family, but I intercede to God so that I can know what God wants me to say to my family, and then I courageously and boldly say it. So that when the kids come and need direction or need help or need a word, I don't say, go ask your mother. And get out of the front of the TV. <laughs> go ask your mother. What a wimp. Y'all still with me? I know what you're thinking. Brother Joe, I was here one month ago when you preached to the ladies on Mother's Day, and you were a lot nicer than this. <laughs> right, you tell the truth, aren't you? You think of that, guys, that were in that service, aren't you? But gentlemen, when it comes to speaking to men, I have a passion. I have a, I have a burning heart that says, men be men of God. Quit giving up. Quit giving over to the enemy. Quit being stupid. Wise up, be discerning, be a man of God, get some backbone for God's sake. Amen. 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 God's called you to be a prophet, and a prophet has to be bold. A prophet can't be lily livered and, you know, and afraid and yalla. Prophet has to be bold and say, I know what the world says, honey. I mean, I know what everybody's doing, but honey, we're going to do what God said. To your children, but my, daddy, everybody, else. you guys say, I, you know, honey, the Bible says there's a road going to hell and many there on it. So just because everybody's going to do it, we're not going to do it because this is what, and then we, we, we preach and teach the word of God at that moment as a prophet of God. This is what the Bible says. Not my opinion. This is what the Lord says. We stand as a prophet before our families. Fifth point is a professor. That's a role of a father. That's a role of a husband. A professor is someone who teaches, and they're teaching, you know, in that greatest classroom of all called the family, called the home. There's more learned there than any other room in the world. Now, unfortunately, we have an educational system which is pretty much just humanism to the core, all right? The schools are now having gay pride days and all the other stuff that the world's doing. You know, everything's acceptable anymore. But if we're a professor, we're going to stand and we're going to teach what is right. And we're going to teach the truth. And we have this great classroom where they can genuinely learn. It's not, it's not a time when I have the kids and say, Mama's gone shopping today. It's my turn to take care of the kids on Saturday that I just stick them in front of a TV somewhere. More harm's done by TV raising children. That's why we got so many infidels in our culture. Not the TV's job to raise your kids. It's not the DVD's job to raise your kids. It's your, it's your responsibility to teach them. And you don't have to be a teacher in the truest context of a gifted person in, the, in a biblical sense of a teacher, but everything teaches. 
A lot of people have asked me through the years about my own family devotion stuff. You know, when my kids were real small, we did family devotions every night. As they got older, we did family devotions about every other night. And finally got about two times a night because everybody was gone everywhere and doing stuff. About two times a week. So what we did and we decided to do very on with our first baby is that we're going to make our home a classroom. And everywhere we go as a family, every time I'm with my son or with my daughter or she would be with our son or with our daughter, we were going to use those moments as teachable moments. And all around us, things happen. It may be a news event. It may be something that happened in school. It may be something that happened out in traffic. It may be something that happened in the church. But those moments are the teachable moments. It's not our responsibility at that point to say, oh, that's just disgusting. It is disgusting. But why is it disgusting? You know? The average kid, by the time he eats his three, that's the first thing out of the mouth. Why? Why? And you can't say, well, don't ask why. Just do what I tell you. You need to t- explain to them why. They need to know why. It's, there are important things that, that are behind the why. There's a God. There's his word. There's standards. There's morality. There's a lot of reasons why. There are good reasons why. Well, you do that, you know, you, you're on the path road to destruction. The Bible teaches this, and you profess, and you teach. I don't know how many times we'd be in the car going on long journeys with my family because I traveled a lot. And that was always constant teaching going on. And, 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 you know, it's just part of our lives as believers anyway that we're, we stand as teachers of the Word of God. You, sir, first and foremost, are a teacher. Your life is being looked at every day by your children, every moment, every, every action. They're seeing what you're doing. You can't be cussing somebody out on one hand and then blessing somebody on the other hand. They see the hypocrisy in that. You know, kids are drugged to church today and their parents say, you got to go to church, you got to be right with God, you got to do this. And then parents go home and fight like two cats with their tails tied together, strung over a clothesline. Amen? What are we teaching? We're not teaching anything. We lose the fight. We lose the battle. So we want to be righteous teachers who not only teach with our lip, but live it with our lives. That's what God desires. We are to be professors. The sixth thing is this. There's this concept of friendship and pal. Friendship didn't work good because it didn't begin with a P. (laughs) So pal is what we'll use. As a husband, gentlemen, you are to be your wife's friend. You are to be her closest associate. You're to be the one she confides in more than anyone else, and vice versa, by the way. Ephesians 25, 28, men ought to love their own wives as they love their own bodies. That has somehow been lost. Men love their own bodies more than they love their own lives. What's that mean? To love my own body more than I love God means that I'll look at other women. To love my own body more than I love God means that I'll just do whatever I want with my body. I'll follow every, every, every temptation. If I feel like doing it, I'll do it. The Bible says in the last days, men's bellies will be their God. That doesn't mean that they'd be gluttons. Most are, but it, it means far more than that. It has to do with just men gives in to their desires, and they rationalize it, and they excuse it, and it's okay because everybody else is doing it. That's not friendship. That's not being the pal that God wants you to be. I love what it says in the Song of Solomon, in verse, uh, chapter 5, verse 16. This is my beloved, and this is my friend. You ought to be able to put your wife right next to you, put your arm around her and say, this is my beloved, but she is also my friend. Now, this is a concept that's been lost many times. Girls have their friends. Guys have their friends. Your closest associate, your closest confidant, your closest friend should be your wife. Should be friendship. But that goes on with your kids. And sometimes we say, well, you can't be parent and friend. Yes, you can, but you can be parent first. And as your parent first and friend to your kids, you know what happens? If, if you do it that way, your kids will want to come see you when they do leave the home. Your kids will be your friend. But parenting has to come before friendship. But you don't exclude friendship. And they become friends as you get older. But you're not friends with anybody by compromising. You're not friends with anybody by giving in. Kids need someone to look to that's strong, that's courageous for God, that's bold, that's not going to be chicken-hearted, but's going to stand. Even in the most difficult of times, they'll be there because these, their family is their best friend and their best confidant, and they can't forsake them. The last part is not on here. It's a P that begins with partner. Let me read this passage to you from 1 
Peter 3. Well, you know what it says. If you've been to any of our marriage conferences, repeat it many times. 1 Peter 3, 17. A husband and a wife. The man needs to live with his wife in an understanding way to, because they are heirs of the grace of life together. So he needs to live with his wife in an understanding way so that his prayers will not be hindered. Our best asset as men is prayer. Our closest asset is God our Father through prayer. Our best asset here on the planet other than prayer is my partner. And the Bible says, if I'm right with her, then my prayers are heard. It's obvious that he's saying, if you're not right with her, your prayers are not being heard. You've got to be right with your family. You've got to be right with your wife. You've got to be right with your kids. But first of all, it means being right with God because you can't be right with anybody if you're not right with God. So you need to be holy. You need to be faithful. You don't need to be fashionable. You need to be faithful. Too many men today are worried about being fashionable. They want to look good, you know, have the people look at them, have the ladies look at them, you know. Always got their eyes grazing across the crowd. Get up in the morning and fix the hair and flex their muscles and, you know, get that look going just right. And then they think their wives are vain. Some of you men have a lot more vanity than your wives do. We've just become cowards. Bow down to the world system because we don't want the pressures. We don't want the problems that might come from following Jesus. Be a man of God. And it will come out in your life through these ways. You will provide righteously, properly. You'll provide security. You'll provide identity. You'll provide unity. You'll provide destiny. Be a protector. Stand in the gap, as Ezekiel said, for your family, for your home, for your, for your community. Stand and be, be a strong protector in your life, physically. Socially, spiritually, mentally, emotionally. Be the priest in your home. Go to God. Take your kids. Take your wife to God. Bathe them in prayer. At the same time, go to God to get a word. Be the prophet to your family. Give the word to your family that they need to hear. Be that person who's going to be there no matter what. When everybody else quits, when everybody else stops, when everybody else bails out, you stay. You be loyal. You be holy. You be godly. Amen. See what God does in your life. There's just far too many men that have been feminized by the culture. They've let leadership go. They've let accountability go. They've, they've let faithfulness go. They've let holiness go. They've let righteousness go. Because that's not real acceptable in the world today, is it? The Bible says, act like men. Act like men. Basically, we say at our men's retreat this last year, man up. God has so much for you. I preach the way I preach like this to men because God has so much for your life. He wants you to go further. He wants you to go deeper. He wants you to go higher. He wants you to go stronger. He wants you to go bolder. He wants you to be all out man for him. And the only way you'll ever understand what that means is just to go do it. And then what God will do, he will fill your life with a sense of satisfaction. There are too many men sitting in auditoriums this morning in churches that where pastors ought to be challenging them, not giving little devotions, giving little nice little happy things. Be happy today. It's Father's Day. You're a good guy. I'm so sick of that. Turn on your TV, you get it program after program. I'm saying get up off your backside. <laughs> Kathy just walked in, I'm trying to be nice. Uh -oh. <laughs> get off your behind. Stand. Be everything God called you to be. The Bible says, having done all to stand, stand and pray. Represent. Be what God's called you to be. God knows how many days we have left physically alive, or if the Lord's return. I believe we stand on the precipice of the Lord's return. I believe if you're going to do anything for God, it's not too late. My mother sent me a little quote on a card many years ago. It says, never too late to start doing what's right. Start now. But I failed. I have an answer for you, sir. God forgives. 
because God is a loving God, because God is a good provider, and because God is a good priest and prophet and takes care of you in every fashion from the physical to the spiritual, you can go to him. And the Bible says if you confess your sins, God is faithful and just to forgive you of your sins. You have a God who loves you, and you can come to the cross, and God will forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Once you take the advantage that he's given you, you may be here and not even know Christ. Well, sir, if you don't know Christ, you don't know nothing. All right? You can live to be 100 and you still know nothing. You may think you know something, but you see what's happened is you have physical life, but you've missed the all-important thing that God designed you for, that you were corrupted by sin, so you haven't experienced it. You were born in sin, so you haven't experienced it. You say, what is it? Spiritual life. The Bible uses the Greek word zoe life. Zoe life is real life, deep life, abundant life, full life, meaningful life. How about your life? Are you satisfied? Are you truly happy? Or how often do you step back and think, is this all there is? There's got to be more to life than this. Am I just sitting here, just kind of work, put my 40 plus hours in every week and go home and do this and do that and go to the lake and do this, play some golf and do that? Is that all there is to the fair? No, that's not all there is. There's life, abundant, full of grace, full of joy, full of peace, full of power to be a man of God. <laughs> Give your life to Jesus Christ. I wouldn't walk out those doors until as a man I said, you know, I believe what you say is true. I believe there's a heaven and a hell and a Jesus who died for me. And I want to take what you've given, Father. I'm not going to reject it any longer. I want to choose to follow you. I want to choose to accept you as my Lord and Savior. I used this illustration in the cruise say, but we were in Belize last week. I said, it's one thing to be going on a trip like that. I made my reservation. I had my email ticket. I really believe that if I got on the plane, you know, that that plane had enough horsepower and could defy the law of gravity because of a law of aerodynamics, run down the runway, get up in there and deliver me into Belize City, Belize. All right? I knew it. I, I got a ticket. I believed in the law of aerodynamics. I believed the plane, that there was a plane going to be at the gate. I had got to the airport and got my boarding pass for the plane. I even went to the gate to get on the plane. But what would have happened if I believed all that was true and still didn't get on the plane? There's a lot of people who believe in God, Jesus, the cross, the crucifixion, the resurrection, the virgin birth. They believe those things. They believe that they ought to be in church. They believe they ought to be, live good. But they still have not gotten on the plane by putting their life in the hands of Christ. Get on the plane. The Bible says receive the gift of God. But it's not going to happen as long as you sit and stare at it. It's one thing to have it here. It's another thing to have it right here. Do you have it here? If not, this is your day, and you're in the right place, sir, to give your heart completely to Christ. Don't let this service pass you. Don't let this day, don't let the sun go down today until your life's been changed dramatically by a God who loves you. Would you stand with your heads bowed? Father, I thank you.